Welcome to the Fangled Cast, brought to you by the folks at Fangled Group, the strategy-first marketing and sales consultancy helping take your company to the next level and beyond. We help our clients convert every touch into voracious advocates for their brand. So everybody, welcome back to a special edition of the Fangled Cast. Normally, we're talking to business people, marketing people, folks in the sort of classic B2B, B2C world. Today, I'm, I'm sort of on cloud nine because I'm getting to interview somebody who I admire. I, he, this guy has made me laugh out loud in public. His name is Martin Olson. And Martin is an author. He's a comedy writer. He's a songwriter. He's worked with guys like Penn and Teller, Rodney Dangerfield. Your children know who he is if they watched Adventure Time because he was the voice of Hudson, I'm sorry, Hudson Ebenezer, the Lord of Evil. This guy's the stuff. And I'm so excited to have him on the show today because we're going to talk about his new book, which we'll get to. And first, Martin, I'd like you to just sort of tell everybody who you are, what you do, and how the heck you ended up on my show. Well, thanks so much, Andrew. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm a comedy writer, so I've been doing it since I was 12. So luckily, um, I mean, it's the same thing that I always tell people, try to, young people, try to figure out what you love to do and figure out a way to get paid to do it. And then you'll have the best life ever. So that's what happened to me. Yeah, that's, that's how I got so big. I thought I could get paid for like eating a lot. <laughs> and then I learned later that wasn't smart and took it, took it right back off. Um, the reason that I, I asked, I asked Martin on the show years ago, a, a mutual friend of ours, a comedian, uh, uh, Kevin Meany told me about Martin's book, which I happen to have here called the encyclopedia of hell. And this is truly in years, one of the first books I've ever gotten that every page got me snorting, laughing, there's, there's, and we'll, we'll, we'll show some of these pages. There's, there's this glossary of terms. And, and one of the greatest stories, I don't know if I ever told you this story, Martin, I was doing a project in ball ground, Georgia, which is up in the mountains, just North of, of Atlanta. And I was sitting in a Mexican restaurant in the little town of Canton. And I had the book kind of hidden, but I was there by myself and bored and reading. And of course it's, you know, the encyclopedia, Hell. it is a comedy book. And this, uh, person who was not challenging uh, uh, gravity, <laughs> who, who probably could have used clothing, maybe three sizes bigger, uh, saw the book and started screaming. He's a dark sider. He's a dark sider. Wow. And the next thing I knew, I had like three, three guys that I know had gun racks in the back of their truck wanting to know what the hell I was doing in their Mexican restaurant. And I had to explain to them that this book was a comedy book. And the way I did it was I just real. opened it up to a... Absolutely. I opened it up to a random page and I started reading some of the definitions out of the glossary. And these guys were crying, laughing. Get out. Absolutely. It was, it no was way. hilarious. Hilarious. I guarantee you there's three guys named Bubba in, in Georgia that own this book because, because, <laughs> because of my, my day in the, in the Mexican restaurant. And, and it, it just, I mean, it's just so, so much fun. I've given it as gifts um, to, to so many people because it's just so clever. Tell Tell, tell the audience a little bit about the premise and, and, and what the book is actually about and how, how it came to be. Before well, we talk about the new a, one. I was a big fan of, uh, of, I was a big fan of Ambrose Bierce, the American writer around the turn of the century. And he did something and he was a newspaper columnist, uh, the devil's dictionary, which was the name of his column, whereby he would just do definitions of, you know, crazy uh, deadpan shit about, you know, things in the 1800s that were relevant to people and he turned on it's the definitions on his head. And I just loved his great wit and, and, and writing style. And he was such a sick, sick comic writer, uh -huh. the stories especially. So I just thought uh, uh, that that would, I should update it. <clears throat> and I was working at the time, one of my co-writers was Robert Sheckley, one of the, a famous science fiction writer who I was a fan of since I was a kid. And I showed him the book that I did. I rewrote it. Uh, and I mean, I wrote up a new modern day version of the Devil's Dictionary. So it's written by Satan. And it's about, it's given as an invasion manual of Earth um, because 
humans are incomprehensible to demons. So Satan is covering every subject matter under the sun about earth and humanity from A to Z uh -huh. so that they'll be familiar with them so they could conquer humans and eat them. <laughs> and so Sheckley said, um, <clears throat> this is really funny, but what are you, why are you doing this? I said, what do you mean? I'm, I'm trying to do a comedy book. He says, it's not going to sell. I said, what do you mean? He said, you need a story for it to sell. So he convinced me. And so I wrote then seven stories in between uh -huh. and made the whole book to be a, a record, a, sort of a history book about the invasion of earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and that I lucked out because that story was so successful. I had, um, I sent it out to all of these agents and, 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 and writers, agents and book agents, because I'm a TV writer. I didn't have a mm -hmm. book agent. Checked it all the way around. Everyone, only two of them out of maybe 30 or 40 people that I, pro, that I sent letters to and sent the book to uh, didn't like it. But the rest of them were all super nice. And I didn't, I got real handwritten letters. I didn't get, it. <laughs> and they just said, uh, this is very funny, but satire doesn't sell. Every single one of them said that. Wow. So it must have, this is around 19, uh, I mean, 2000, I think. So then uh, I sent the book out to, I had sent the book out to three friends. And one of them was a producer at Warner Brothers. And two, a couple months later, he called me and he said, hey, I sold your book. Wow. And, and he was, on, I said, what, are you fucking kidding? He said, I just got rejected by, by over 30 different publishers and agents. He says, I said, well, how did you, I mean, so Warner, Warner Books, he says, no, 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 I sold the film rights. I, I said, are you kidding me? Because Andrew, I don't know if you know, the film rights is like the, 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 the golden egg that writers will look for because you don't make money writing books. Sure. You make money from, from the film. And so it was like, you know, almost $400,000 for the film rights for, that I got. Wow. In the, in the movie, it took three years for them to wangle through the different directors and the stars and stuff. But uh, it, it was ultimately just shelved because each studio has a quota of books that are likely to make successful films and, that, and, and they have to fill the quota of them. And they've had faith in this one because this producer, Andrew Lazar, who was my buddy, um, I'd written a bunch of film stuff with him and for his company. At, he has a housekeeping deal at Warner's. And so they trusted him. But ultimately the film was um, shelved because it came out they were going to try to make it the same time as Constantine. Is that the name of it? Oh, was sure, it sure. A, yeah, with uh, what's his name, Keanu, a demon hunter. Yeah. So, I mean, I still got the money, and if it had been made as a movie, though, then I would be extremely wealthy because I would, the book would have sold worldwide. Yeah. Um, because as it is, it still was astonishingly successful just by word of mouth. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's how I found out about it was, was word of mouth. By the way, if it gets unshelved, I get to play Demon 3's fourth victim. That's, <laughs> that's who I want to be in the movie. Well, that's a deal. And, and if, it's, if that role's not available, I'll take fifth. I'll be the fifth victim. <laughs> Have you done acting? No. Uh, <laughs> I, I would be really dead. good at playing a corpse on like uh, CSI. <laughs> that would be, that'd be the extent of my, my, my acting you job. Have a good You have a good deadpan delivery when you're... <laughs> <laughs> because your sense of humor is pretty fucking wild it, <laughs> and delivery always amps everything up it's funny you mentioned kevin meany right yeah yeah so he was one of my writing partners and one of my favorite people to write with i did he and i wrote a our hbo comedy special together and we wrote a series that one was an award winner in london he calls me up. Hey, do you want to be head writer for my show in London? I just got this deal. Wow. <laughs> so then, next thing I know, we have a, we're, we have a apartment, a flat up in Mayfair and we have to, he and I wrote the whole show ourselves. So it was just this amazing thing. Funny story about that. It was very shocking to me, but it was helpful to me because everybody's insecure in show business, especially if you're a writer because it's ever shifting sands. But 
when I, I had learned from my, one of my other writing partners, Jeremy Kramer, who I wrote the SAG Awards with and who was Robin Williams' writer. Uh-huh. <clears throat> and he, um, I, he and I were writing partners, head writers for Comic Strip Live for Fox, which was a stand-up show with sketches in it. Sure. And Jeremy, the first thing he did, he said, because we walked in, I didn't know how to be head writer for a show. I knew nothing, but I didn't know what to do. And so, uh, but I've written a lot of been on staff on shows that I, so yeah. he said, no, we got to go and get, talk to the music, depo- music department, see what they have for a music library. I said, what do you mean? He says a music library and see what sound effects and what things that we can use. We can punch up the show for the, and that was, that was like gold, <clears throat> something yeah. to learn. And so when I went over to London, I said, well, I want to fi- find out what, what music library we can use. Right. And, and um, so I went to this address that the, the producer sent me to, and I'm going up these old rickety stairs. It's like an ancient building. And, and I get to the door and a guy, old guy lets me in this old, I mean, it was like a, like a movie set. Uh-huh. And there's only one leather chair. And then across at the other side of the room with records everywhere on the walls, he sits behind his desk in front of there and he says, so what can I do for you? So I was nervous, but I just said, uh, tried to be confident as I could and said, well, I want really bad spy music. I want, um, really, I want over the top, uh, easy listening music, the worst music you have. And I, and I told him three or four other things. He paused and then he said, and he started laughing. I said, what's so funny? He said, 10 years ago, John Cleese sat in that chair and asked me for exactly the same things. <laughs> yeah. Talk about a badge of honor. One of the funniest human beings ever on the so planet. That lifted my spirit. So I knew that as a result of Jeremy, my writing partner, telling me to ask for that. And, and then I just told him what I actually wanted, that that boosted my confidence a lot. Yeah. I'll tell you, if, if there was somebody, if I had a choice of who I could have lunch with, just <laughs> that's one of the, my top three on the list would be John Cleese. I just think he's. Oh, you got that right. I, his, his most recent uh, biography is brilliant the the, the this guy get like, it yeah john by the way his original it. name was john cheese his family name and they changed oh it that's to, right yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> which is which is hilarious all in itself so, so that was uh it, in the show that show ended up because kevin meany is one of the funniest people i've ever met in my life and we used a lot of the music and he and i wrote some songs together and just it turned out to be an award-winning show so it's just funny. You never know how something's going to turn out. I yeah. mean, in that case, I was lucky. I had the world's greatest producers. You know, yeah. um, I think the greatest irony of Kevin Meany called Kevin Meany was truly one of the kindest people I ever ever had the opportunity. Oh my God, to he's the with. nicest man in the world. So. Yeah, I miss him. I miss him. Yeah. So that was a tragic loss. Yep. Well, but anyhow, yeah. let's 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 cheer things up a bit. Let's talk. <laughs> now that we've now that we've just buried our friend Kevin. Let's let's well, I should actually show you the if you don't mind, let me show you. I just got a box full of the books of uh the yeah, show me book. the show the cover so we can do that. Let's introduce this brilliant new book, which which if the audience is curious, I've actually already read bits and pieces of it because so this is coming my, out as the sequel to the hell book. Yep. And it's after the demons in the first book <clears throat> attack and conquer Earth. Excuse me. So what, what do they conquer next, Martin? They find out on Earth that heaven exists and Satan, who has no re- recollection of his of how he got there, he created hell and all of the demons out of the fabric of his mind, <clears throat> out of his evil imagination. So he knows he did all that and he knows there was just him, just in the blackness of this thing he just calls hell and created that as well. But he doesn't know how he, how he got there. Mm -hmm. So on Earth, he hears these after they eat all the humans and they totally destroy Earth. um, He hears about that there was a creator that created everything. Of course, he can't even admit that could be true, but maybe it is because he doesn't remember. Sure. So he finds out the mythology is about heaven. And in the second book, he's 
he is going on a, a solo rogue mission using a Merkava, which, uh, which is a, a mystical uh, tra traveling device. I mean, Did he by chance get that on Amazon? I saw they were running a <laughs> <laughs> It was a, it's a, it's a, it's a vehicle of light that you create with your mind. It's Merkava is an old mystical thing. People think that some of the UFO stuff is actually these old dudes doing this Merkava traveling. But this is the book where he goes to heaven to try to find God and kill him so he can uh -huh. end the whole thing. So it's the conquest of heaven. And I lucked out that I got the greatest illustrator to do the frontispiece, which is Albert Chi. I love it. Who's a... So much fun. Who's a uh, illustrator from South Korea. I saw his work and I said, oh my God, I got to contact him. And then he, it turns out he knew about the Cyclopedia of Hell. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yeah, I'm right in tune with you. So I said, well, let's, could you do the frontispiece? And he was really happy about it. So I was so thrilled with this book. So this is, uh, this comes out on August 31st. So... I'm very happy with it, and I hope that people find it funny. They they absolutely will. The, the excerpts that I've seen from it um, that we shared before before we we recorded, I, I I have to admit that there were three snorts, a giggle, and a and a little booger uh, a booger bubble <laughs> that came out while I was while I was reading it. So, uh, well, it, plus, I mean, who knows? Maybe I'll be able to sell the film rights to this too, and maybe something could get made now that there's two stories because it's a trilogy. Feral House, uh, which is the publisher, I mean, uh -huh. it's, it's, was my favorite publisher in the world. Um, it, and they only publish nonfiction. Uh -huh. So I wanted to tell you the story of how, how the Hell book got published because it was, a, please, please. I mean, it doesn't make any sense because I was rejected everywhere, right? Uh -huh. so I sold the film rights on a fluke. I mean, what's that about? Before it's published, and I mean, it was the manuscript that was that I sent my three friends. So after all, all of the, after I've sold the film rights, after the, after it was shelved, the film, I was playing because I play piano at comedy clubs mm -hmm. and I write for comedians. Playing for the at the Steve Allen Theater uh, at the Ron Lynch Show, one of the funniest comedians in the world. And, um, and it was a midnight show. And after the show, we'd go out and smoke some cigarettes and have a beer out of the patio. And the guy who ran the theater, Amit Idleman, who's a genius songwriter and musician and playwright. I mean, the guy's amazing. Very well-connected guy. He, uh, he didn't know that I wrote a book because, oh, an actor came up named Ken Daly mm -hmm. while I was talking with Amit. And he said, hey, by the way, I read your book and I thought it was fantastic. And he was t telling me how sincerely he was laughing and I just was so thrilled. And then he, when he, he left, Amit said, you wrote a book? I said, yeah, so, but I couldn't get it published. Nobody published, it's a satire doesn't sell, but I sold the film rights. <clears throat> so I, it was a success <laughs> yeah. to me, I bought a house. <laughs> yeah. So. <clears throat> So he had a weird look in his, he said, tell me about it. So I told him the premise, Satan is, hell is overcrowded <laughs> <laughs> and Satan wants to uh, attack earth and use it for the land space, for the real estate and to, and to, and, and use uh, the, the inhabitants for food stuff. So he has to, um, and I told him the whole thing about writing the encyclopedia and I told him about the stories in it. And then he had a weird gl glossed over I mean, it was funny too, because he was, I think he was smoking a cigar and the, it looked like he was in a movie, like a movie shot. And he was staring up at like a, like he was spacing out. I said, are you okay? And he said, I just got a flash. Well, I said, what do you mean? He says, tonight, do you have a full copy of the book on, uh, because this is at the beginning of, 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 of email attachments and stuff. Sure. This is way back. And I said, yeah, I just finished putting up, doing a mock-up of the entire book with pictures and everything. So he said, tonight, I want you to send it to my friend who's the head of Feral House, Adam Parfrey. I said, I know Feral House. That's the best publisher I've ever seen. It's all, it's an underground. 
I said, Amit, they don't do any fiction. They don't do any comedy books. This is like, it's mm -hmm. just all nonfiction. He says, do me a favor. Forget everything that you know. He said, I just had a flash. I didn't know what a flash meant. Yeah. <laughs> but he said, I just had a flash. When you go home tonight, could you please write him an email? Uh, uh, here's, and he gave me his, he told me his email. I wrote it down, the Adam Parfrey's email at Feral House. He said, send the book as an attachment tonight with a letter to him saying you talk to me. And so, you know, I, 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 you know, a lot of people suggest things and I didn't know Amit that well. I knew he was a genius, but I thought he was off base with this because it was, yeah. Feral yeah. House does nothing like my book. Sure. And also, uh, you never send a book cold to anybody. You do a query letter. And I mean, there's ways that you don't piss people off. So I, I briefly said, look, nobody sends a whole book to someone. He says, just do me a favor. Do me a favor. And tonight, send him a letter and attach the whole book. He said, I saw something. <laughs> and i didn't know i don't know what that meant so i said okay i will i'm gonna do it as soon as i get home he says promise me you will <laughs> so so i did and two weeks later adam parfrey wrote me back i mean i sent i sent the email i said i met a meet <laughs> and he, he told me i said i know it's not protocol but I said, here's the book i'm attaching it because he asked me to do it and so adam parfrey who was a, a hilarious guy and a really good businessman and a very extreme character i mean he was tough as nails and he was the sweetest guy as well but he was he had such a crazy sense of humor and his books are intense man he has the most the stuff other people won't publish he would publish that's why i loved feral house huh. but it's nothing to do with the comedy at all and he wrote me back and he said dear martin feral house does not publish comedy screenplays uh fiction of any kind and, and he said a few other sentences and then there was a space and i'm scrolling down and he was fucking with me yeah so i i would i'm waiting minute. to hear you go until now <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> said, but in the case of the encyclopedia of hell i would be delighted to publish your book he says call me at your soonest convenience and you know, you know what i mean it was just the craziest shit ever yeah, I just want to tell you how, I mean, I had gone through every possible uh, normal route to, to try to sell a book. I yeah. mean, I, I, I talked to everybody. I mean, I'm, I'm a well-connected person. Yeah. But I just couldn't get it published. No one was interested. First of all, the subject matter. I mean, it looks like it's a real, I mean, the whole idea of it is it's supposed to be a straight deadpan. So it just was an odd, odd thing that it was a psychic flash that my friend had just by chance that actor friend came up and started saying how funny the book was just by chance. I was talking to him out there whom I never had a long conversation like that with before. Yeah. And he suddenly has a psychic flash. Yep. Some, <laughs> I never, I, ever would have sent, sent the book to Farrell House. Yeah, I, I love, I love this story. So many people I know who have had, moments of brilliance that or, or or things that came in their life the stories are are, are similar you know really? guy, what's, what's an example well I, I a friend of mine who who had been unemployed for a number of years and he was a brilliant engineer but not a not not the kind of guy that you would want to hang out with and he was with <laughs> me with me in an airport and we were talking and he was talking about an idea that he had and I, I don't want to go into the exact detail, but it was, sure. it was a way of solving a real problem. And the guy who was sitting on the bench behind us turned around and said, you guys are just screwing with me. Wow. And I went, do, excuse me, do, do I know you? And he said, do you know me? And I said, no. He said, come on, you guys aren't just playing the tell the story and hope I overhear you game. Get out. And I said, no, I really don't know who you are, uh, except that you're the guy eavesdropping on our conversation here at the airport. <laughs> and and it, it turned out that he was in the business looking for someone with his skill set because he was trying to solve a problem for an RFP for the government, a re request for, for price for a project that was about a, about a $7 million deal. 
and he, could, out. and he could not solve the problem. And this guy had the solution. Get he out. Ended, he ended up being the vice president of, of technology for that company for. Oh my God, years. you're kidding. So, um, how come you didn't get brought along? Because, because, because I'm the side, I'm the sidekick. <laughs> Has anybody but, done a book about how business? Uh, the premise of the book could be how 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 business really works. You know, yeah, and it would be about the the act the the acts of chaos and chance in how yeah. our world is created. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my my whole career was built on. Uh, being in the right place at the right time and recognizing opportunities other people never recognize. That's what my that's what my my life has been. Give me an so, example. I mean, this is a this is actually valuable to your audience because this yeah. because people think that you have to go through the correct channels. I'm telling you, in my life, and I'll tell you a couple other stories as well. And I want to hear yours. Yeah. The, the just the the just putting yourself out there is more valuable than going through the goddamn normal channels because I've gotten yeah. my my biggest jobs and stuff like that by pure chance of just going out yeah. there and talking to people at random, not trying to do it, just doing it and, and, and getting the word out. Yep. Well, it's so a good thing that you? I figured out a way to make my my hmm. podcast all about me. So so it's it's really up my alley now. <laughs> well, I'm I'll give you I'll give you a short version. I was I was working in the steel drum industry. Yeah. And we were looking at whether or not we were going to start making drums out of stainless steel as opposed to steel for very specific applications. Yeah. So we were doing these calls to people in the wine and beer industry to find out if that market made sense. And we were talking to these guys and they were all complaining in the wine industry that there was this massive shortage of wooden barrels for aging wine. Really? Um, and they were all, everybody was on allocation. There were, they, they couldn't get them. And and in the conversation, we were talking about the difficulties of keep, you know, but you can't reuse them and this kind of stuff. And one of the guys said to me, well, I use the stainless steel ones for this application, but the age, I need the other. And he said, boy, if, if, if somebody figured out a way to, to merge the two, I'd be, and the light bulb went off above my head. Wow. And, and I said, well, what would happen if I made a stainless steel body and attached oak ends? Huh. What would that do? Well, what it did was it reduced the amount of evaporation, Get it out. gave more control, Get out. Uh, and one oak tree makes three barrels because you need these huge staves to, to make, you know, to, to build the barrel. With the removable heads, one tree became 100 barrels. Get so, so there's an ecological story. The, wow. You still get all of all of these pieces came together and there's a, a, a I have a patent that's owned by the company I was working for at the time. Yeah. For the hybrid aging barrel. Wow. And it was literally just, you know, the, the brain went, wait a minute, I think he's onto something. And then we figured out how to make it happen. Andrew, um, you were at the right place at the right time. That's exactly what happens to me so much. And, and, it, and, and you weren't looking to solve any problem or looking to get into this was the chance thing that happened. Yeah. And just because you're an inventive guy, suddenly, and by the way, I'm an inventive person too, but sometimes I can't think of a fucking thing. So it just it, <laughs> yeah. it also depends on if I had my breakfast this morning and, yep. and my aunt didn't die that day. <laughs> you know, was it that Curly used to say, "I'm thinking, but nothing happens." <laughs> 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 yeah. But American philosopher Curly from the Three Stooges. <laughs> you got that right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that would make a very, very good book. I wonder if anyone's written it yet. Let's check this out later. Yeah, well, time, but, but about the nature of, uh, of human history, actually, and certainly business and success is, is mm -hmm. like, there's so many examples of chance, like that story you just said of where suddenly someone says something to you and it, it turns a light on, you know, mm -hmm. or yeah. I talk to my friend and suddenly he has a mystic vision of saying and tells me to do the most absurd wrong thing any business any writer who, who practices yeah. good business he would never do that and yet it was exactly the right thing yeah so. it's it's amazing how those those moments in time where it, and, and it's so so funny because my real curiosity is yeah. how many times do those moments occur that people don't recognize it happened and, and it just passes how many oh, brilliant ideas so fell in the river because the the guy was looking for bear you know you're so right brother and i'm telling you the main thing is too what you just said reversed that how many times have people not 
taken advantage of those magical moments where where chance and chaos mm -hmm. and, and the magic of of right place, right time, right idea are right there in front of you, and they're too self centered or not open enough yeah. to hear it and to think and to respond. They they're so want to pitch their thing so much, and so that I mean I can't tell you how many. This is another good example in terms of business. Uh, in order to get writing jobs, you have to pitch shit. You have to pitch yeah. shows and stuff. And so many times in preparing a pitch or something like that, with because you have to go in with a partner. And I mean, it wasn't always the case, but now I always have to go in with someone younger. And uh, certainly diversity is the number one thing in the, the group of three that you go in with. And so uh, whenever I'm preparing a pitch with someone, and so the idea gets improved immensely by just being open to hearing their thoughts about it yep. and how they would change it. And sometimes you, you resist because, wait a minute, that fucks up this part of it. And, and then I say, wait a minute, you're right. You know what I mean? Yeah. If I was locked in, it would, the idea would just be sitting there the way I had it. And also, so then they're way, my partners on the pitch are way more committed because they have a creative input that was super yep. huge. So in terms of business, listening and allowing yourself to recognize those moments of insight, are, are the, it's probably the most important thing in, in terms of being successful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we, we, we talked about this before we were recording. One of, one of the keys to, to truly succeeding is recognizing that, that never in my life have I ever had a brilliant idea that somebody else didn't make better. Yeah, that's it. It's that's very really important. It. That's also the cure for for the uh, an egomaniac. Yeah. So. Yep. Yep. And it's you know, so so often we see in the corporate world these these CEOs and management people who just surround themselves with with the yes men, or yes, they hire problem. people like them. When when I hire, yes. I'm always looking for. Uh, people that that don't think the same way that I do that will call me on um, and then many times they don't oh, know what your idea is not it doesn't work in this and that and they're not right but I do listen to all of them and I weigh it and I, I I run it through that that process because you you can't you can't possibly possibly be the arbiter of all the right decisions with no help from anybody else it's well, impossible dude you, this is a this is a valuable business conversation because let me tell you a, another story that happened sure. to me. And this is about writing and TV. Uh, my first TV children's show job was with Joe Murray, who was an animator, and he had never done a TV show before. But he didn't like. He was getting all these agents sending him scripts, and they were all like animation writers. They're all the people that done all the other stuff. And he was a different kind of thinker. He so the show was Rocco's Modern Life, which was oh, I love that show on Nickelodeon. One of the few children's show I ever liked. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was fantastic because of this guy Joe, and here's why it was a success. You won't believe it. Actually, it's unbelievable. But this is really the the key to it is he said, "I don't want any I don't, agents. I don't want any animation writers. I want people that have never." written for a TV show before. He says, I mean, I mean, I want people that are just comedy writers or written for comedians or, or, or artists who haven't, haven't worked on shows before. I want to see all those guys mm -hmm. who are rejected by everybody <laughs> because they're yep. too weird. And so he got, so I, so uh, 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 it was total fluke. I mean, I, my stuff ended up on his desk. He says, this is fucking weird. I want to meet this guy. Yeah. And he hired me because we got the second part, of course, is you have to be able to get along. Yeah. You have to, you can't be a jerk. So I'm out. Tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all are out. We all have different <laughs> types of our life. So it has to be the right time during your career. And also he hired this young guy right out of school who all he'd done was a comic book and a couple animated things he'd done in, in Cal Arts. And that was Steve Hillenberg, who later was the creator of SpongeBob. Oh, wow. Really, so he hired him because he wasn't a regular, he was a weird weirdo, but he was yeah. the sweetest guy. Ever. And then he hired two other guys, uh, Swampy Marsh and Dan Povenmire as a team, a director board guy, 
and because they were fucking weird and they didn't follow any of the rules and they were nice guys they yeah. were respectful people which we all were and they ended up being the creators of of phineas and ferb disney's mo most successful show in history yeah and well, you, you were you were part of that no they hired me as their head writer because yeah. because uh i had written the stuff and i was like the main one of the main writers for, for, for Rocco and I actually wrote most of the episodes <laughs> but uh what I'm getting at is that Joe Murray whose show it was didn't follow the rules at all he just he went for things that were different and not mm -hmm. what was expected and it's sort of in keeping with what we're talking about of of, of not going the normal routes with things to be more creative and open to the unusual mm -hmm. to new ideas Yes. Fucking, if for big for big money success, that's what really happened. Because in yep. effect, Joe Joe Murray by hiring those guys and giving them careers, there might have been no SpongeBob, no Phineas and Ferb, and all the and the other people he 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 brought in. Doug Lawrence is head, who was the, another guy that he hired who had never worked before. He's now head writer for SpongeBob. <clears throat> I mean, these are the biggest shows. Yeah. And Joe yeah. Murray, as a result of this, kind of created modern animation by hiring those people. Rescued us from a Holly Hobby and the Power Ponies. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> you so, know, it's, it's funny. In, in, in our work, you know, we, we're, we're a, a consulting firm. We're not an agency. We do strategy consulting and the implementation of tactics. So we have a crew of, of about 90 different freelancers that we build teams with. And among those freelancers are our creative teams. So the skill in the marketing world of being able to work with creatives, I describe it as the ability to pick up Jello with your bare hands. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so we, and, and years ago, it was my running joke. It was the crazy hot scale for dating that, the, you know, you draw a line and you, know, you have a line <laughs> and no matter, you know, if you're, if you're going to date someone, no matter gender or otherwise, this isn't a sexist thing. Yeah. The person who you choose to date, can be exceedingly crazy as long as to you they're also hot. But as soon <laughs> as soon as as soon as the heat uh, is less than the crazy, you got to go. <laughs> so, so it's the same with it's the same with creatives. So if I'm dealing with a graphic artist who's freaking brilliant, I first of all know that they're going to be a little eccentric because it's part of the game, and maybe they do, maybe they don't ever meet the client. But I'll put up with an extreme amount of crazy for in, incredible talent. Yeah. So, and, 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 and that's why so many of the campaigns that we work for our clients are just so different and interesting because we get great people to do them and we know how to manage them. I just but, love talking with you about this, man, because it's funny, the, the parallels parallels with, with, with my job as a writer in Hollywood and your job uh, as a consultant in business. I mean, that it's really true because the most successful guys we're not we're the ones who are the most bold and the most yeah. open to new ideas yeah well let's 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 go back to it what when you're writing you're thinking about the audience who's going to read what you're writing and how they're going to react to it and I'm and how it's going to not doing that I'm, well you're not what i'm doing is i mean look you imagine that, yourself as the audience i oh, this is true of everyone that i know who's successful <laughs> as a writer and it's not an obvious thing so you're premise is uh, is a is a logical one mm -hmm. but it's not true good what, what, what it is is you write for yourself uh-huh you absolutely don't write for the audience yep um if you're doing like a soap opera or something like that it's the opposite but yeah what, what we do as comedy writers is you don't there's no way to write comedy for someone else it's, it's mm -hmm. impossible yeah to just write it for yourself yep but Cause... likewise with oddly enough um, I'll, I guess the easiest analogy is that comedy is strangely similar to horror writing because it's a setup and a punchline mm -hmm. and uh, drama is, is the same as comedy because you're always building to something to some reveal and so the whole idea is you you can't write for someone else unless you're doing something that's a, some some kind of a show that's just for a an, an audience that obviously it isn't supposed to be creative and it, it, that's not the premium thing. It's just going to be a, 
some, a knockoff of something else, which is certainly also a viable business plan, yep. but it's not going to be anything that's going to be groundbreaking. <clears throat> it's it going to make the... a lot of money though, but yeah. the groundbreaking stuff is going to be stuff that you write for yourself. So all of us and all of the shows that I've been on, the, we write for ourselves. We don't write, for, for example, on children's shows, we don't write for kids. We write for ourselves when we're 12, things mm -hmm. that we would want to see and that would make us laugh. And then there's no way that it's going to be bad. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. in, in, the, in the business world, especially when we talk about like product development, which is a big part of marketing, uh, there's, I, I, I always say there's, there's basically three categories. There are known problems in the world that people recognize. And when I come out with a solution for that problem, it's a no-brainer. You've got this problem. Here's the product that solves it. Here's the proof. You're going to buy it. Then there's products for problems that people don't realize they have. But when oh. they see my product, they're going to recognize it. Oh, so I, I joke, I joke, it's when you make the perfect mouthwash, all of a sudden people recognize their breath stinks. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then there's the shit they sell at three o'clock in the morning uh, in between the news, uh, which are problems or products designed to solve problems. Nobody has, nobody ever will have, but we'll talk <laughs> them into it. <laughs> that's, you know, the, oil salesman. you know, the, my, my favorite now is the, the we've, all of these years of people getting terrible injuries from can openers. We have a new way of opening cans. <laughs> and, it's, and, and if you buy, if you buy today, you get the second one for free. Just pay an extra fee. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> and, and so, so in, in the marketing world, if you're not focused on what that audience, they, it may not be a problem or, or a, a challenge that they have right now, but you have to recognize that it exists. Or at the end of the day, you're building a product that nobody's going to want or need. And I get, I get all the time proposals from people wanting my help. And yeah. when we do the initial research, we're like, start over. Your, yeah, your, yeah, your, yeah, your yeah. dream has two guys in Uganda that may need one of those. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, to, to go back to the idea of, uh, of the parallels, um, you could look at look at it this way because also I think the most successful stuff that I've done is I'm a songwriter. Yeah, songwriting you don't make money writing books, um, and you make a good living writing for TV, but nothing like music. Mm -hmm. So I've written like 400 songs for Disney and other companies. You know what I mean that have been on the air. Yeah, and it's the most lucrative thing that I do. Wow. Wow. Basically, the main thing is through BMI and so that the royalties are now worldwide. And uh, certainly with all of the Disney affiliates that they're translated into in like a hundred different languages and so on. And the royalties on all those as well. Yep. So when you write a song, there's, you don't have, you have, you're not, you can't possibly write for an audience unless mm -hmm. if you're doing a, something that's supposed to be catchy and new and different. Yeah, you, you write it for yourself. Yeah, unless you're writing pop, pop, uh, K-pop, and you know, girly, get the girls dancing music, then well, it's a formula. Even then, though, even then, uh, I remember uh, my one of my co-songwriters, John Colton Barry. His father, Jeff Barry, is one of the world's most successful songwriters, and he wrote uh, "Sugar, Sugar" and all those Archie. Oh, songs. sure, sure, sure. And even when he was doing that, he, even though it was supposed to be you know that type of pop yeah bubblegum music without his genius and writing it for himself so that he had fun and loved what he was loved the melody he wasn't you know what i mean it had to be yeah. something that he wrote for himself sure i get i got you that's interesting so that is, and writing a song there's absolutely no way that you could you could i mean you, you don't back engineer something creative like that for it to be really good unless it's something that, that, that you love. Suddenly you yeah. come up with, a, with a, if I'm playing guitar or the, or the piano, uh, suddenly something say, wait a minute, what was that sound? What the hell was that? And then, uh, then it just comes out as magically out of nowhere. You know? yep. And those are the t moments when you know you have something good. And those are all the songs that, that sell. Yep. You know, it's funny. I was listening to an interview of, I, I was a huge, Boingo Boingo fan back in the day, a band. Oh my God. Danny I Elfman is one of my heroes. And I've never heard Danny Elfman interviewed before. And there was a reason he was on a podcast because he just put out his first solo album in like 30 years. And the guy, I think it was Mark Marin, who was doing the interview, yeah. said, um, boy, I bet you made a lot of money on that Simpsons theme. 
And he said, no, but thank goodness I said the Simpsons because that I made money on. <laughs> it was, it was, right. it was him saying that that made him all the money off of that show because the music, it was a one-off and he didn't, he, there was no, there was no deal for royalties or anything, but the words made him. That's uh, uh, the afterthought. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that his family, by the way, he's like a super creative guy. His, his brother, Richard Elfman, uh -huh. who was the drummer and, and percussionist for, for Oingo Boingo right. is, a, is a friend of mine. And oh, wow. the stories that he tells about how they've got things going, because it was very difficult because they did underground music. I mean, it was yeah. weird. It was like music played by elves in german forests you know what i mean with yeah. devils and dancing <laughs> yeah the, the, it was the knights of the oingo boingo was the original oh my god it was the craziest shit ever but listen you got to check out that interview because he talks about the origin where he he went through years where he would only listen to music that was like from the 1930s <laughs> and he he knew nothing of the popular music rather because he was danny elfman was only listening to that stuff can you and, send me a link it's yeah. I'll have to afterwards. I will. It's uh, yeah. Mark Maron's the WTF uh, podcast. Oh, I can just look that up for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it was it was the greatest. I was hooked to. The, I was on a drive to visit a client. I've been you know locked up for the wonderful world of this. I don't know if you've heard, but there's a virus going around. Um, but uh, so I was driving an hour away, and I put on that podcast because I I just loved his music over the years. Yeah, just so too. clever, the lyrics, the music, all of it, and to hear the story behind it. Sometimes, you know, you, you, you like, you know, today could have been a disaster. We've never really had a face to face chat. This could have gone completely south. And I'd be like, well, I thought I liked that guy. But, you know, <laughs> many times you meet you meet the people that you admire and you find out there's no reason to admire them. In this case, yeah. I yeah. like his music more now. I was a huge Frank Zappa fan and continue oh, to yeah, be. Me too. I the love greatest. saw him in concert. I, I've, I've met his son several times, loved his music. And then I, I watched this long series of interviews. And I could see why some people didn't like the guy, <laughs> but, but, but he's brilliant. It just, his yeah. music, he's clever. He was such, so relevant. We were joking yeah. about 20th century philosophers, Curly, yeah. not as much as Frank Zappa. <laughs> it was with my, the philosophers of our era, Frank Zappa, Warren Zevon, uh, Tom Waits. <laughs> Damn right. Damn yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, so anyhow, so I think. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, what's the time frame on this now? Oh, we're so far over time. People oh, are falling are? asleep. <laughs> Three people have already dozed off and ran off the road into a ditch. There's a guy in Pensacola, Florida, trying to get away from an alligator that's chasing him because he, <laughs> he was listening to this horrible, this horrible conversation go, go out in the left field. Um, no, yeah, we're, we're perfectly fine with the exception of the dog barking in the background that I probably should I have stopped it. Uh, give, about give, 20 give minutes ago. Give feel to it. Yeah, it's my door. It's my doorbell. I live in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, it's really good talk, talking with you, Andrew, because it's very interesting. The parallels between my job, which is a creative job, it's not a business mm -hmm. job and yours. I mean, that was that's very useful to me. And it's good to hear that these principles are universal, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. It, the, it's, it's funny because when, when I, I talk about this and sometimes I get accused of being a little and I, I can't even think of the right the right adjective. Yeah. But there, there, there are categories of jobs out there. There are jobs where you have a specific set of tasks that you learn how to do and you do well and should be proud of being able to do. Accounting, right. assembly, yeah, right. these kinds yeah, of right. things are jobs um, that, that require people with a different type of, of intelligence and a different type of skill and, and attention and things like that guys like me don't possess. If yeah, I had to work in an office doing what these brilliant accountants do every day, I, my head would explode. And then there's jobs where you you make it up every day yeah. as you go forward. And, yeah. and those are the things that excite me. When I get up in the morning and think about a new project, yeah. it, it's all about the creative influence behind the practical business that we do. Yeah. That's why I love what I do. Yeah, you have the best of all worlds, I think. So your job is probably one of the best jobs ever next to mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah well you know as i said this isn't all about me i, I i'll take i'll take a firm second place in this in well, this competition i'm, you, I'm sorry this interview i was very <laughs> <laughs> I, I say with all uh, humility that i just lucked into the best job in the world i mean to go in and get paid to laugh every day with 
these other genius guys. Yeah. And then to be able to do all this music, I mean, it's, 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 I just, I never would have dreamed that I would have this life. So, and plus it's really good pay. Yeah. <laughs> and I meet all of these fabulous creative people and, and we, it's the most fun job ever. So, yeah. so I just was very lucky that I was able to sustain it this long. Yeah. I'm just curious about the, I'm, I'm worried about the controversy this book is going to cause because we live in this era of, of this fake wokeness where, where we all want to be offended. And I understand that the people from PETA are actually going to protest to ban your book because the demons, <laughs> well, it turns out that the demons are, are meat eaters. <laughs> and they certainly are yeah so I'm, I'm curious how you're going to address that controversy and and whether you want to make a public statement uh to the to these uh these PETA people to explain to them that no actual humans were devoured in the making of this book <laughs> well I have a whole other concept on that which is this that I think that in the book uh, because the the whole my one of my favorite things is just revolution anyway so uh if only there was some way and i think my next book might deal with this of how to communicate with dogs because dogs have supernal minds almost human mm -hmm. minds um it depends on when you what time of the day you hit them <clears throat> and they um just to urge them to overthrow their masters I mean, just to kill everyone and and take over. Yeah. So, but I would just wanted to get them to wait because AI and AR and 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 certainly uh, cyborg type of stuff is a reality. I think that um, it, there was an article last week that said in 15 years we're going to have literally cyborgs. Yeah. And um, so with dogs, they can have uh, helmets whereby they could communicate higher th thinking mm -hmm. and could kill everyone because everyone loves a dog that i mean they can yeah. sneak up on people and rip their throats out and take over so PETA, i think is also going to be destroyed they're all dead you know what I mean? the animals are certainly going to be killing them first yeah well i know the aliens and this is this is something that you have to keep in mind when aliens invade uh they are in fact going to eat the vegans first because they're more tender <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. Didn't think that. yeah, it's true. And it, it, it turns out I was reading in, in, in a magazine that doesn't exist called Unscientific American, that we only yeah. need to be worried about your dog scenario. If we see dogs inventing robots to rub their bellies, so then they won't need us. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, all these things. Are, in fact, you maybe think of a um, I have to do a bunch of videos to promote the conquest of heaven. So the ideas of dogs with a thought helmet on it that only dogs can hear encouraging them to overthrow the humans their their owners i think that would make a good video for this book inspired so inspired by the book yeah yeah thanks for yeah. that idea yeah <clears throat> by the way pugs don't bother they're never going to overthrow anybody they're not <laughs> interested they got other things to do hey, did you have dogs as a kid always yeah, always me too. I think always. it's a, I think it's a, I mean, let's face it, sometimes you just have to be lucky to yep. have the circumstances to be able to have a dog, but yep. it changes your personality. Yep. S sadly, my my big guy passed away during, not because of COVID, but during COVID, my, my yeah. I had a big Shiloh Shepherd. So it's heartbreaking, man. Um, well, I actually, he's, and this, um, this isn't a joke, but I, 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 in my kiln, I cast, if you see the gray in here, his ashes are the gray parts in this glass piece I made. Oh, um, God but bless anyhow, you, man. so so we we decided it was time to get another dog because we have yeah. a little guy named, we've got this dog who's about this big named boris because you know you gotta, <laughs> i love it my, my shiloh shepherd was 85 pounds his name was tiny um <laughs> so so anyhow uh we decided three criteria for a new dog yeah no shedding because we're done with tumbleweed yeah. and tumble hair in the house Fair enough. He had to be a smart breed that we could train and yep. won't scare the crap out of the neighbors. So I, I went out and I bought a standard poodle and <laughs> decided since he's French, it would only be fair to call him Jethro. He's my answer. To, <laughs> he's my answer to freedom fries. He's my, my French. <laughs> so, so anyhow, Jet, Jethro is, is the, the cutest 
dog in, in the world. We, we, we absolutely adore him. When I brought him home, he was the same size as Forrest. And now he's four times the size. Oh, and that's wow. who, that's who you could hear in, in the background. I don't know what the heck he was doing, but wow. um, so we, we've, I'm, I'm now training and my, my youngest daughter was working in Columbus, Ohio. She's a brilliant hair uh, designer. Yeah. I, I think that's the word she uses. That's what I call her. And she had an opportunity to come back to town and work here. So she's living with us for a month or so while she's figuring out what she wants oh, to wow. do. Oh, wow. How and great she, is that? She How brought her Yorkie. She brought her what? little Yorkie, who, oh. who we're so proud to know is named Doobie, which is a whole other story. Uh, <laughs> and, and he's not a brother. Uh, but uh, so we have just dog chaos in the house right now. I love it. And I mean, that was... I can't tell you how what an influence it was to me just in my personality. I look back now and you can see having dogs changes your personality and yep. softens it and gives tolerance and, and understanding of, I mean, you have to deal with a, a different species. Yeah. That <laughs> so loves really, you. That yes, loves that you and needs loves you and needs you. Yep. And so it's such a motivator to, to be able to, become a better person to be able to be friends of the different yeah. species like that it really changes you and it, talking about talking about business i mean i think that it's because of me growing up with dogs that i was able to learn the secret of pitching mm -hmm. in terms of my business and that is to <clears throat> switch places with the person i'm pitching with yeah well, think about single, it at an early age it's a companion it teaches you how to communicate differently and exactly. as you start to get a little bit older, then you have to learn responsibility. Exactly. And how to care, how to care for another being. Yeah. And then as you get older with a dog, it's additional company and, and caring that you need to get through the rough parts of being an adult. And yeah. and and it's at, at every stage of your life, that relationship with that animal changes and benefits you as a human being and makes you a whole person. You can't. <laughs> You know, that's why if you if you look at the stats on the real dangerous people in our world, when you go back and you look at their psychological profiles, almost all of them were cruel by animals as kids. Yeah, you're it, right. It's dog dogs are such an important way to, to have children become whole, caring, intelligent human beings growing up that communicate better. Well, listen, in this conversation, we've run the gamut of comparing yep. our diverse fields and found many, many commonalities that are important ones. And I mean, one, you just, one you just mentioned about, uh, about dogs, I mean, nobody writes about that shit. Yeah. And that's in order to be a good business person. I mean, I can't, I'm telling you that all those things you just enumerated, that's the reason why in pitches, I can switch places with the person I'm pitching to and, and, and say, wait a minute, what yeah. do they need? What do they need? So that would be the key. At that, what would I want to hear if I'm them? Yeah, in all of that, I, it was so evident to me later in life that it was a result of having dogs. I mean, that yeah. was a huge character builder for me. Absolutely, absolutely. And when people ask me about this podcast, I'm going to say it was going great until it went to the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just tickled that a, a topic like that about like dogs and stuff like that has a relevant um, angle on on how to how to improve yourself as a, as a viable business person. No, I, I tend not to trust people who don't like dogs. I don't have that opinion of people who are afraid of dogs because there's usually a reason yeah. that some irresponsible owner made that did something that caused them to be afraid. But people yeah. who don't like them, I'm always a little suspicious. I'm, I'm not always right, but they're, they're well, just something true. so... I mean, the, the interesting thing is with creatives and I'm sure, sure, sure with business is that people who don't like dogs or don't have, who have psychological problems, that doesn't mean that they're not wonderful people with amazing fucking imaginations yep. and genius. It doesn't mean that at all. All it means is though, that they're a different breed of human being that, uh, that will not be as open to yep. things. Yep. That's all. Yep. I agree. So before we wrap up, yeah, I got, I got a, one, one more pitch. Tell the people right. out there who, who wonder why the hell do I want to read a book about hell? Why yeah. should, why should they, and I, I, I highly recommend if you don't get both books, you got to get both. You got to get the encyclopedia of hell and you got to get the new one because they're, they're, they're hand in hand. I guarantee that you will shoot milk out your nose at breakfast. If you're reading at the table, you will, you will be reading paragraphs from this book to your friends because you want them to laugh. And, and I want to know, I want to, I want your, your opinion. 
if, if I'm someone who never heard of the great Martin Olson, who, by the way, was not Rowan and Martin and also not Martin <laughs> and Lewis, just to make sure you know which Martin we got here. Yeah. And it's Marvin the Martian, not Martin, who, who had the Q whatever modulator. And my, oh. my best friend, Joe Alasky, did the voice for Marvin. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I love that character. So anyhow, tell, tell, tell us again why, why and how we can get a hold of this, this rotten tome of, of evil that's so damn funny. Well, I was just so lucky to, to I mean, I did this on my own no, and my wife said, you're crazy. What are you going to do that for? Why are you, what are you going to do that for? And I said, because it makes me laugh. And so I think that it would, that's what I want to do. I'm writing for myself all the time. And my kids loved it, but my wife wasn't sure about it. My agent wasn't quite sure about it. <laughs> but, um, it turns out she helped me hugely. And she was unbelievably helpful in selling the film rights. But this was a book written for myself. And, it, and, and when the film rights sold, I, I had confirmation that, it, that people thought it was extremely funny. And... Um, uh, the, the publisher, when I told you the weird story, when he said, all I want you to do is do, be aware of social media. So as it was starting up, that was like in the yeah. year 2000. Yeah, it was, you were and, big uh, on CompuServe, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, just do a, just do a silly Facebook page and see what happens. And within, within a two, a year and a half, there were 200,000 fans of the book and and on their own, uh, go to the uh, Facebook Encyclopedia of Hell page because <clears throat> on, on, on their own, people around the world sent in photographs of themselves with the beholding the book and it yep. became a thing. So yep. there are like 600 photos on just of people around the world who, had, who were fans of the book and sent in yeah. photos. So that all sort of started not by any, there was no advertising. Mm -hmm. It just was the book itself. So, yep. so that's the only thing I would say. If you want to, I think it, it's a proven laugher. <laughs> yep. And, and right. also I'm known for writing for the uh, uh, outrageous comedians. And so I put all of my heart and soul into this in terms of what I wanted to do to try to write the funniest book ever written. <laughs> I, I think you're, you've pretty, pretty damn well accomplished. Yeah. I, I, it, I'm, I'm just, I'm a huge fan. I'm, I'm, well, it's never, I'm, I'm you're, never gonna write the book. you're never going to write the funniest book ever written, but you're not going to even have a chance if you don't try. So that's what I did. Yeah. Well, I've written, but they're owner's manuals. So not, not too many people have laughed, except the Dude, part, about, to, except the part about not using it in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or switch so, that around. Yeah. By the way, the best, the best video on your thing is uh, friggin' Ed Asner talking about <laughs> your book. <laughs> it's the oh, great <clears throat> So I go, we go to Ed Asner's house. I said, uh, Ed, could you do a, could you do a video of this book? And he says, is it funny? I said, yeah. So he said, okay, come on over. So we went into his office and he's the sweetest guy in the world, by the way. I said, I'm going to write something for you, but it's going to be pretty sick and, and, and disgusting. He said, beautiful, perfect. So, <laughs> so if you go, to, <laughs> if you go to uh, on YouTube, the Psych, in Psych of Hell channel, you could see Ed Asner uh, doing my bit. And, it, and he did it word for word. It was the funniest shit ever. And I brought him a, you know, one of those skull uh, vodka bottles? Sure, sure. One of those have, clear skull ones. Uh -huh. So I brought it, I said, Ed, I brought this for you. And because he likes to have, we had cocktails after we did it. And I spilled his skull all over his desk and ruined his tax forms all oh. of the fucking taxes were <laughs> I, and he kicked me out he says you motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> so i so this time with this book with the conquest of heaven he said he'd do it again he's much he's 10 years older now yeah but he says but let's reenact me kicking you out of the <laughs> it'd be great it's a sp spilling booze all over my tax thing. Yep. You know what? So if, if folks have made it this far into this, and this isn't something Martin's asking for, this is me. Yeah. Instead, everybody buy a copy of the book and get a picture taken in a place where the book doesn't belong. Yes. <laughs> please, please, please. We, we want to, we want, if you're in France, 
we want it right next to the butt crack of a statue at the Louvre. If you're if you're at a, a protest of the what's that? What are those guys? The 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 the, the, the those awful protesters that protest gay funerals. Oh go, my God! Go go the, the, the what the what the heck? Are they? I can't think of the name of it. It'll it'll come sure, to me. Something that yeah West, yeah they, West something church. The Westboro Baptist Church. Yeah. Go oh out God. in front of them and get a selfie with the book with the leader. <laughs> Hashtag Encyclopedia of Hell, Volume Two, or whatever. We'll we'll come up with something. And oh we'll, my we'll God, that is it. the greatest idea. I, I, I would I would, I would love that. I would I would love to see in front of a daycare center in front of. <laughs> just, here's the thing: nothing illegal. <laughs> nowhere, nowhere that's going to get you arrested. We're not responsible. Use your adult brain to do it, but take this book somewhere where it doesn't belong and get your get a that's selfie with it. And I'll tell you what, if when at the end of 2022, let's say, let's say six months in on this day, we're recording this on August 17th. So August 18th, my birthday, whoever has the greatest picture is going to get to take home my friend. (laughs) This is the prize. (laughs) And by by the way, his his name is Susie. And by the way, you designed that mouth on that thing, right? Yeah, it was a little, yeah. little, little, little time in Mexico. So, which is a whole other podcast. But that he's up, he's up. The greatest inappropriate location of Martin's book wins Susie the Devil. Well, I want to thank you for having me on. This is really fun, needless to say. And uh, uh, I, I can't thank you enough for having this interesting conversation because I've done a lot of podcasts promoting the book now and because a lot of people have been, have been into it. But this is a special one because showing the, showing the parallels, the commonalities between creativity and, and, and good business mm-hmm. is a valuable goddamn thing. So yep. I'm, I'm really glad we did this. I I'm, I'm so honored that you agreed to come on. I've been wanting oh to meet God, you. We've been we've been joking at each other for years now. Yeah, that's um, right. <laughs> back and forth by text, and it's the first time we've we've really had a chance to to sort of pseudo meet. someday we'll we'll be in the same city, and I'll yeah. uh, I'll, I'll I'll buy you a cup of coffee as long as it's not a large. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andrew, thank you very much. Thanks, You're a so good much. guy. And this was really fun. And also the things that you brought up, I hadn't talked about in a while, and I actually w- it was helpful to me to try to focus in on. Uh, on the promos I have to do for the book. So thank yep. you very much. Yep. I, I wish you massive success with this book, the next one and everything else that, that you do. I, I really, I admire your work and I'm, I'm so glad to have you in my, in my circle of, of, of people I admire. Thank you well, so thank much. You, man. For and I, I certainly admire what you do now that I understand it because there's so many things in common. Yep. And the, the bottom line with this is just uh, my website, which is, martin dash olson o-l-s-o-n dot com has all the info on it about the book so yeah. everybody just order it on on amazon is the way to go yep buy the book we'll put the we'll put the links and all the connection stuff out there for the, the fangled audience if you're watching this video subscribe to the fangled cast you may like other ones that we do more yeah, importantly right. share it Make it go wherever it needs to go to help promote Martin's work and his book and everything else. Uh, you know, go get your photo taken. Do a selfie where the book doesn't belong. I'd love, I'd love to see some church photos with some nuns with rulers getting angry with you because you brought this evil tome into the church. And and we uh, we thank everyone for listening to this. Uh, was it twelve hours we've been we've been talking? About? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Andrew. Thanks so fun. much. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. See ya. The Fangled Cast is brought to you by the great people at the Fangled Group, where we help you convert every touch into voracious advocates for your brand.